Well, we are in the third week of this faithful series that we've been doing throughout this month, uh, partnering with what's happening in our, in our children's ministry and beginning to understand what it means to be people of faith and what it means to be full of faith. And those are important questions. But honestly, where we're picking up in the story of Saul, who's going to become Paul, which is what Pastor Mark spoke to us about last week, where we're picking up in the story is lending itself to a very specific question. And that question is this. What are you afraid of? And before we get too much further into that, I want you to know something. When it comes to the staff at Maiden Lane Church, you want to know what they're afraid of? They're afraid of me. Check this out. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I have for the past three months. So in case you're wondering, what has Pastor Tim been doing all during COVID? And what's happening here at the church? I'm not working at all. I'm just running around scaring people uh, because that's way more fun. No, seriously, we do have a lot of fun here. and We've tried to make the best of a weird situation. Um, but yeah, I'm scaring people like crazy. And the worst part is when they try to scare me, I barely jump at all. And it drives them crazy. So uh, honestly, I also recognize that as you watch that video, the most embarrassing part of the whole video is the noise that I make to scare people. I didn't realize it sounded like that until it was recorded. So I apologize for that awful, awful noise that comes out of my mouth as I scare people. Uh, but when we talk about real fear, when we talk about not just scaring people as they walk in a door, but life and death kind of fear, we're going to see this week that uh, what Paul is going to experience after this encounter with Jesus that Pastor Mark talked about last week, the, his encounter with Jesus is one, going to provide a, a new direction for him, but two, it's going to provide a whole lot of opportunities for him to potentially lose his life. So we are picking up in the book of Acts in chapter 9, starting at verse 10 through 31. And you heard from Legos last week. This week, I want you to hear from a comic strip. So check this out. The Bible, it's 66 books of history, stories, letters, and poetry that fit together to form God's one big story. The epic adventure of how he created us and loves us so much that he made a way to rescue us. As we travel through the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, we discover people who met God and found their lives changed forever. Now for an amazing story, inspired by the book of Acts, chapter 9, verses 10 through 31. Ananias, a believer in the city of Damascus, paced the floor of his room. What will we do, Lord? Several days before, the Jesus followers in Damascus had received terrible news. Saul of Tarsus is on his way. He has permission from the high priest to arrest anyone who follows the way of Jesus and take them to Jerusalem. Ananias shivered as he stared at his door. Why haven't we heard anything yet? He knew that at any moment, guards could knock on his door. A voice could shout out his name. Ananias. <sighs> Ananias had nearly jumped out of his skin. And then he quickly realized that the voice hadn't come from outside. Um, it hadn't come from inside either. There was only one person it could be. Yes, Lord? Yep, 
Ananias knew that this was a vision from God. So he took a deep breath and waited for what the Lord had to say. Go to the house of Judas on Straight Street. Ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. <gasps> Ananias gasped in shock. God wanted him to seek out his enemy? Saul is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man come and place his hands on him so he could see again. That man's name is Ananias. Ah, a million thoughts tumbled through Ananias' head. At last, he found his voice. I've heard many reports about this man. They say he has done great harm to your people in Jerusalem. Now he has come here to arrest all those who worship you. It must have seemed like a home run argument to Ananias, but God responded. Go, I have chosen this man to work for me. He will announce my name to the Gentiles and to their kings. He will also announce my name to the people of Israel. Uh, I, well, okay, here goes. So Ananias grabbed his cloak and hurried through the dusty city. But as he finally reached Straight Street, his steps slowed. He forced himself to breathe evenly as he approached the home of Judas. Help me, Jesus. Give me the words to say. Ananias stood in front of the door for a long moment, gathering courage. Then he knocked. Boom, boom, boom. What do you want? Ananias shared his vision. As Judas led Ananias through the house, Judas explained, Saul won't eat or drink anything, not since they led him here three days ago. Ananias peered into the back room. A man was kneeling there, his hands knotted in prayer. And even though the man's eyes were open, they didn't focus on anything. Who's there? Before he could lose his nerve, Ananias went straight to Saul and put his hands on Saul's shoulders. Brother Saul, you saw the Lord Jesus. He appeared to you on the road as you were coming here. He has sent me so that you will be able to see again. You will be filled with the Holy Spirit. As Saul blinked in surprise, something like scales dropped from his eyes. I, I, my eyes, I can see. Saul leapt to his feet and faced Ananias. I need to be baptized this instant. Now Saul, also known as Paul, had always been relentless in his quest to wipe out the believers. But now that he himself had met Jesus, he was equally determined to share the good news. Within days, he started preaching at Jewish synagogues. Jesus is the Son of God. Is it Saul the man who caused great trouble in Jerusalem for those who worship Jesus? Hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners? Though Saul now believed in Jesus, he still had much to learn, and he wanted to discover all the answers himself with God's help. So he spent several years studying the scriptures, and after that time, he came back teaching and preaching about Jesus as fiery as ever. Jesus is the Messiah. He fulfills every promise in scripture. The Jews in Damascus and even the governor of the city uh, were angry at all the um, upset Saul was causing. Time for him to, uh, Sleep with the fishes, shall we say? They made plans to capture and kill Saul, but Saul and his friends discovered the plot. It appears they've even guarded the gates. That leaves the windows. Saul's friends led him to a home built into the city wall. When it was dark, they brought out a large basket. You've gotta be kidding me. You really wanna try the gates? Saul stepped into the container and his friends lowered him out the window and down the wall on a rope. Never thought I'd end up as a basket case. Once safely out of Damascus, Saul set out for Jerusalem. Home sweet home. When he arrived in Jerusalem, Saul immediately tried to join the group of believers there, but they were afraid of him at first. One man, Barnabas, had already heard Saul's story. Cheer up, man. I know you're the real deal. Let me take you to the apostles. So Barnabas did exactly as he promised. He took Saul to Peter and James and the other leaders of the early church and told them the whole story. So Saul stayed with the believers in Jerusalem and preached there just as boldly as he'd done in Damascus. And once again, a group of Jews became upset with him. Someone send that man to sleep with the fishes. But once again, the believers helped Saul escape. This time he went back to his hometown of Tarsus to wait for God's next directions. 
In the meantime, the group of believers in Judea and Samaria continue to grow through the power of God's Spirit. Isn't that an amazing story? How interesting how Paul is drawn into this idea of being a leader for Jesus after being a person who persecuted or was opposing Jesus all the way up to this point. Uh, and, and what strength Ananias showed by being willing to step into a situation that made him uncomfortable. So I don't know about the sleeping with the fishes part, uh, but, but the rest of that I think is super important for you to understand, uh, to see how Paul is growing in his faith. But as I read through that scriptural text, and as I even watched the video with you today, I was thinking about one word, and that word was fear. I feel like all through that story, fear just keeps popping up. And I'm so grateful to be able to teach this specific lesson to you because I feel like the fears that are being faced throughout this story are fears that are consistent with how we feel even today. So the the first person that I saw who had fear was a man named Paul right? And this guy had tons of fear. And, and, and the fear that I bet was creeping up inside of him was, am I willing to really change my life completely? Am I really going to change it? Am I really going to become a completely different person? Up to this point, I had been walking one direction confidently and boldly. Am I willing to go somewhere completely different? In fact, saying the opposite of what I was saying. Uh, I heard a really smart man recently say these words. What he said was, the most important thing you can do is have the boldness to change your mind. And I think it's a lesson that Saul shows us. He not only changes his name, but he changes his mind. He goes from someone who says Jesus is not who he says he was to someone who is bringing others to faith. And that is a really important question that Paul had to wrestle with. A man named Ananias was also struggling with fear, wasn't he? What am I going to do here? And he actually had to stop and consider this question. Can God really change people? And am I willing to bet my life on it? See, because if Ananias steps into that situation and he goes to visit Saul at the time, who became Paul, if he goes in to visit him and that man is still trying to persecute Christians, the truth is, is that Ananias may lose his life. So when he hears this message from God and he's starting to consider whether or not he's actually going to do what God is asking him to do, he has to come to terms with the question, can God really change people? You know, sometimes I wrestle with that question. As someone who grew up in the church uh, and someone whose own faith journey doesn't have a ton of ups and downs, although it has a few big ones, sometimes I wonder, does God really change people completely? And can God really do a work in someone's life that makes them a completely different person? And that's why I'm so grateful to be part of this church family because I've heard stories that have resonated in my spirit about how God can change people. And because of you, because of those of you who have had those kind of conversion experiences where you were walking one direction and God took you a completely different one, I can bet my life on it now because I've seen it. God really does change people. But Ananias had to wrestle with that. You know who else had a ton of wrestling to do was the disciples. I mean, think about this. This man has been trying to arrest them. He's attacking them. He was present at the stoning of Stephen, where Stephen was actually killed. And all this time, they know to be fearful of Saul of Tarsus. And now here comes Saul, who is now Paul, who is saying, I can see clearly Jesus is my Lord and Savior. I want to be part of you. I can only imagine the fear that they experienced. And they had to wrestle with a question, and the question was this, can we trust him? Are we willing to trust this man after everything that we've been through? Is he the real deal? Is he coming to us just trying to get intel? Is he trying to figure out how he can swoop in and arrest more of us in one spot? And I got to be honest with you, the disciples were not very accepting of Paul when he arrived. The last person who I was thinking about when I thought about fear was this person, Barnabas. Now you got to understand, Barnabas 
is in a room full of disciples who are not really sure about this guy. And Barnabas stands up for him and says, I believe his story. I've seen it. He's the real deal. We need to allow him to join us. But the question that Barnabas had to ask himself is, am I willing to stand up to other followers of Jesus? Isn't that a question we still need to ask sometimes? I mean, just because you and I are followers of Jesus doesn't mean we're always going the right direction, does it? Are we willing, for the sake of the gospel, to stand up to each other when something isn't right? What would it look like if you had to confront someone in this church? How do you think Barnabas felt confronting a group of the very few people who were actually following Jesus. Am I willing to stand up to other followers of Jesus? Well, no matter what the fear looks like or, or why you're fearful, or maybe one of those fears or one of those questions that we just talked about resonates with you, I think the, the combative piece of fear, the thing that can actually help us through fear, the weapon that battles fear is one word, and that word is courage. So Pastor Tim, what is courage? Okay, so if you're fearful today, I want you to lean into what I'm talking about here when it comes to courage. First, courage is a willingness to go. Notice I didn't say where, because I don't know where. But it's a willingness to leave comfort and go into something that you know is where God is calling you. That's been very hard for me. I spent years running from a call to ministry because I didn't want to go into that. I had a plan but it wasn't this. But courage is the willingness to step into something that may seem a little uncomfortable at the time. Second, courage is the clarity to not conform to the people around you. Courage is the willingness to say, it's okay for me to be different. It's okay for me to be in a group of people and not have agreement with them. It's okay for me to stand up for the things that I see as right. Because God is leading me to do that, even if those around me don't. I think Barnabas, like we were talking about before, clearly exemplifies the clarity to not conform. Barnabas ends up taking Saul or Paul to the apostles, to the leaders of the group, to make that connection for him and put his own name on the line. He chose to not conform. Lastly, I believe when it comes to courage, we need to have the strength to place loving others above our own opinions. Isn't it time for that right now? I mean, think about it. Right now, whether you have opinions about COVID or you have opinions about some of the racial divides in our world right now, no matter, or you have opinions about how we gather back together, or you have opinions about the upcoming election, we are full of opinions but courage is the willingness to put placing others, loving others ahead of our own opinions. Loving others matters more than our thoughts matter. I've been looking at Facebook a lot recently. I know you have too, and it's, it's exhausting, isn't it? I've been looking at Twitter. It's even more exhausting. I've been having exhausting conversations with people. And I got to tell you, there's only, I guess this is the best way I could put it. There's only one thing about being a Christian that should be offensive, and it's the gospel. The gospel is the only offensive part about what we do. So if what you put online, if your opinions are offensive, you need to learn to communicate better. If your opinions cause others to shudder inside, that's not being a strong Christian. That's about putting yourself and your opinions above others. See, if we are going to be people who let the gospel be offensive, we cannot be offensive. Do you know what's offensive to hate? Love. Do you know what's offensive to isolation? Community. Do you know what's offensive to racism? Unity. 
See, the gospel of Jesus Christ is the most offensive thing to our world on its own. So if I'm going to offend someone, I want to offend someone with the gospel, not with some picture I post on Facebook, not with some opinion about racism, not with mask wearing or not mask wearing. Folks, we need to let Jesus be the offensive one. And I know that sounds kind of strange, but truthfully, the offensiveness of Christ does all the work for us. Our job is to love well. So what does it look like to have the strength to love others above our own opinions? This is not only something that we're facing in these times, but I got to tell you, next week when we meet on Sunday morning, this has the opportunity to pop its head up again. So there's some things that I've been thinking about specifically as we meet back together, and I want to point those out to you. What I want you to consider why we are meeting See, if we don't know why we're at church anyway, if we don't know why we're at the campgrounds anyway, it's all going to get confusing real fast. So consider why we are meeting and not how you wish it was different. Change is hard, and some of the changes that we're making right now are not permanent. But if we can remember why we are there. So let me ask you a question. Why are you going? Why are you going to come to church? Never thought about it? I'll tell you why I want to come to church. Because I believe there is strength and there's power in being with other people who are on the same journey I'm on. And there's something about offering you love and, being, and receiving love that matters to me. But why are you coming? Secondly, respect the boundaries given by the church as well as the boundaries of individuals. Listen, some of the people coming are not going to believe the same way you believe. Some of them are not going to be handling our health crisis the same way you're handling it. What does it mean to put our opinions second and love them first? It means we respect the boundaries of others and don't just blast through them because we feel different. We care for each other well, right? And I've seen you all do this, and I've been a part of it since I was, man, 10 years old. I've been a part of this congregation that has cared for me so well. In the middle of a season where people seem to care less and less for each other in our world, can we be a church that cares for each other well? In order to do that, our boundaries have to be set aside, and we have to follow the boundaries of the church and the person that we're actually communicating with. We're going to make that easy for you, try to at least, we're actually, believe it or not, and Missy will go over this when she talks on Wednesday, we have stickers that you're going to put on when you arrive, and those stickers, believe it or not, are going to be a signal to other people about how comfortable you are with physical touch, so that you don't have to tell everyone that you come in contact with, please don't touch me, or you don't have to tell everyone you come in contact with, I would appreciate a fist bump. You don't have to do those things because we're going to help you with that. Okay, But please respect the boundaries of why you're coming because it's not about you and it's not about me. It's about we. And that matters. And third, when you arrive, I'm going to ask that you show love. Man, we need love. Our world needs love. And I got to tell you, after the conversations that I've been having with many of you, many of you just miss the love of gathering together if we will elevate that love and drop our own opinions and remember why we're even gathering together, next Sunday could be the most beautiful experience you've ever been a part of. So if you're hearing all that and you're thinking, Pastor Tim, I'm just not ready to come back. What we're doing for you right now, we are going to continue to do. In fact, I want you to know that not returning doesn't make you less a part of our congregation. We understand that these are weird circumstances, and we want you to know that it is okay to stay at home as long as you need to. But for those of you who are coming, let's come with the right frame of mind, and let's remember why we are gathering together. Bottom line, when you let God take the lead, you can have courage in the face of the unknown. You, when everything starts to fall apart around you, you can have courage in the face of the unknown. This reminded me of a really impactful scripture in 2 Kings chapter 6. It talks about a, a prophet named Elisha, not Elijah, Elisha. 
And this prophet was in a situation where he was in Israel and a king from a neighboring area, uh, King Aram, was coming to capture Elijah. And his, one of Elijah's uh, people that, that served him woke up in the morning and he looked out and he saw all these soldiers coming to get Elisha. And he says, prophet, there's too many of them. And Elijah stops, and you need to read this scripture because it's way more detailed than this, but Elijah stops and he prays what I believe is a very impactful prayer, and this is what it says. Open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Man. Open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. God, may you open our eyes in 2020 so that we may see what you're doing around us, Lord, because sometimes it's impossible to see. And after Elisha prayed this prayer, the servant looked out, and around the soldiers who were coming at him, he saw chariots of fire. He saw an army of angels who were coming, who were there, who were many more than were coming for Elisha. He just couldn't see them. And what I want you to know is, as our world seems to, seems to be so confusing right now, and gathering back together seems so confusing, and all these things around us, we have more questions than answers, what I want you to hear is that God is up to something in our town. He is up to something in our church. And if we will open our eyes, maybe we can catch a glimpse of how God is moving throughout this county. Open our eyes, Lord, that we may see what you are doing. That is my prayer for us as we regather, that we would see the angel armies that surround us and the angel armies that are fighting battles in the city, that we would be able to see more clearly than we have ever seen before. Because the bottom line, again, is this. When you let God take the lead, you can have courage in the face of the unknown. Because when God takes the lead. We are not alone. So today, I want to begin to pray for you now as we regather together. I'm going to pray that God will give you a boldness and a humility to gather together with each other. Lord, we come to you right now, and we know that we are not alone because you are with us. God, you are moving through the city. You are moving through this community. God, we see you moving around the world. And Lord, in the face of, of anger and hatred and frustration and confusion and and hurt people. God, we pray that your angel armies will show up around them and that you will give us as your people the courage to have the willingness to go and step into situations that are unknown. That you will give us the clarity, God, to, to see things and do things differently than the people around us. And that you will give us the strength to set aside our opinion. Because love matters more. Lord, may we represent you in all ways. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.